I appreciate that introduction. Um, I have to admit, I've worked on the issue of violence against women for over 25 years. And it wasn't until last year when I had the privilege of actually joining up with two master's students and helping to supervise them that I began to think about the issues around the links between sanitation and women's vulnerability to violence. And part of what I'm going to share with you today is the research that uh, they pursued uh, in order to try to begin to get a handle on uh, the links that we see between violence and, and lack of opportunities for proper sanitation for women. Um, first off, I mean, I think we have to acknowledge that sanitation, even though we don't talk about it very much, is, is actually a human rights issue. It's linked to some very fundamental human rights that we acknowledge and work on, um, including sort of right to dignity, right to health, right to privacy, and right to safety. And I think it's this right to safety issue that we haven't really teased out as much as uh, we probably should have. Um, so what I wanted to share with you today are three studies. One is, was done in Kenya by Amnesty International. And the second two were, as I said, collaborations between WaterAid, uh, SHARE, and students here at the London School of Hygiene doing their master's thesis. Um, all of them dealt with sort of women's perceptions of, of issues of sanitation in a variety of high-density urban settlements, or what was frequently called slums. Um, and one of the overarching findings from these is not surprising, but still sort of important to think about, is that women felt that they themselves suffered a much greater burden from the lack of good sanitation facilities than their male counterparts. I mean, they acknowledge that it was a problem for everyone, but one of the things that comes through the research is the ways in which women really felt that this was a gendered phenomena, and that safety and shame, a really deep, uh, pervasive shame, um, as well as violence and harassment, were the things that came up in, through all three of the research studies. So what I'm actually sharing with you today is, as I said, the, the first is from an Amnesty International report that's available on the web called Insecurity and Indignity. Um, the second two are now published as policy briefs by the SHARE Consortium, and you can also download them, um, and by Karen Massey and Shirley Lennons. So, Going back to sort of the overarching thing that comes out of these studies, I mean, one of the things is, you know, women pointed out, I think, the obvious, which is while men can uh, basically stand up and urinate anywhere they want, um, with very little shame, actually, um, women are forced to use facilities of some sort or open defec uh, defecation. So that right there, there's a built-in sort of biological uh, inequity in terms of the burden of lack of facilities. Um, the women also talked a lot about how because the men left for, to go to work, they were able to, for example, hold it, so to speak. So they could wait until they were out of the shanty town, uh, use facilities outside, use facilities before they came back at night, and therefore were, again, able to somehow, by virtue of their mobility, get around some of the issues. Um, we also heard earlier um, about the issues about menstrual management, and it's another dimension of the lack of sanitation which women have to confront um, every month that is, is you know, not, as, not an issue <laughs> for men. Um, and, and the lack of privacy and the shame associated with that, interestingly enough, even though it shouldn't be a shameful thing, you saw that a lot in the discussions um, and in the, the uh, texts that the women um, uh, used in terms of talking about their experiences. The third thing that really came through is shame related to what the women called home toilets, which was more or less having to defecate in your home. And so using a bag, using a pot, 
something like that. And what they said is that there was a lot of shame associated with that because you're not supposed to dirty or sully where you live. Um, and yet late at night, if you think about it frequently, um, they, they were confronting either taking on that shame or potentially taking on the danger of going to communal toilets. So one of the women, for example, says, well, there are two main difficulties for women when it comes to toilets in our community. The first one is money, and that's another thing that's interesting, is you have to pay for these communal toilets, and women have less access frequently to, to um, income. And the second is that at night, men can easily rape and murder us. So here's a woman from the Nairobi slums. Um, she's saying, over half of us, this is in a focus group, take five to ten minutes to get to the toilet. If you go out at night, you will get raped and assaulted. For women, this is unique because it's not just the risk of an assault or a mugging, but the sexual violence as well. So this comes from the uh, Amnesty International study. Again, it was a purposeful sample of 130 women from four different slum communities in Nairobi. Um, they were specifically looking for cases of women who had experienced harassment, so about 50 percent reported um, experiencing some form of sexual harassment or sexual assault. Um, the average distance to toilets in this facility was over 300 meters, and, and the women talked especially about the dangers at night. Frequently, the major coping strategies was this e issue of home toilets, uh, just not using the toilets, or trying to get men um, from the family to accompany them at night. And, and one of the things that was interesting, especially for me, who's most, most of my research has been on partner violence, so violence within the family, is despite this incredible risk with sanitation-related uh, issues, the majority of women said that their dominant form of violence in their lives was violence from their partner. And we see this over and over again, where the focus of the international gaze <coughs> on issues, whether it be uh, conflict situations or post-conflict situations, is always on the sexual violence component, which, again, when we're thinking about sanitation, we're thinking about the risk of, of going out into the world. Whereas, while that's, I don't mean to demean that risk or, uh, or say it's, you know, that it's tolerable, it's still not the dominant risk as women um, talk about it in their lives. So this, this is a woman named Rose. She <coughs> lived in one of these Nairobi slums. And she was, um, she and her family have no toilet or bathroom um, in the plot that they live in. This is where she lives. And you can imagine how difficult it is to na navigate uh, uh, this kind of uh, environment even during the day, much less late at night. She has to walk about 10 minutes to get to the community toilet and pay two Kenyan shillings to use it. Um, this is the community latrine that serves her neighborhood. But she has four children, um, she doesn't have a husband, and her family often can't afford to use these toilets. And at night, she considers it too dangerous. She also risks her health um, trying to navigate or wading through the streams of open sewage that separate her from the community toilets. Lack of waste disposal and form formal sewage lines make the road difficult to navigate even in daytime. A second study that was done by one of the master's students here, uh, uh, the dominant themes that came out in that, and this was in outside of, of Pune in India, uh, was fear, not surprisingly, afraid of harassment and rape when using public to toilets or defecating in the open. Um, there were actual reported incidents that women could name and very specifically. So one of the things that we were trying to get at in this research is is people often talk about, yes, this happens, yes, this happens, but when you actually try to get them to name specific incidents, it, it's very hard to pin people down. But actually in here, there was a lot of concurrence about specific incidents that women could name. Um, there was also a lot of anger that was expressed in the focus groups uh, from women who 
felt that the police and the community and everything were really letting them down, the government was letting them down, that, that they shouldn't be put into what they saw as a shameful and, and, uh, situation and um, felt like that th they were really angry about the lack of attention from government. One of the things that was done as part of this study is, was to actually make a map. The women made a map. This is actually a translated version of that map. Um, but it shows the overall areas of danger and where um, women felt that they were vulnerable. So not the numbers on this map, I don't know if you can see them, but refer to different things that the women said. So for example, number two, which you can, oops, Number two, which you can see over in, on your left, um, says that men shine lights on women when they defecate in the open here, and on other occasions, men hide in the sewers to watch them. One woman, while defecating, was raped and murdered here. Another thing is that having just come back um, from Delhi, it's, it's uh, excuse me, you know, I said this was Pune. This wasn't Pune. This was outside of Delhi. Um, <laughs> having just come back from New Delhi, th there's a huge, huge uprising and discourse now going on around rape and, and sexual harassment due to some of the horrific kinds of things that have come out in the news recently. But this was a study that was done by UN Women together with a local NGO called Jaggery, um, just asking women, um, not specifically in just in this settlement, but in this eastern part of Delhi, you know, the percentage that had experienced different forms of har harassment and abuse. So here you see, you know, up to 46% of women say that they've experienced stalking, um, 66 verbal abuse, 10% sexual assault. Um, only 10% of the sample had experienced no form of violence. The third study was from Uganda. Um, done by Karen Massey. Again, many, many of the same themes that you see. Few toilets, they're poorly maintained, they're locked at night, uh, they're unaffordable, uh, the safety risk of traveling to them, um, <coughs> and the burden, again, that women felt, oh, I don't know why that happened that way. Uh, didn't do it on top of like that when I did it at home. But anyway, the, the you know, the burden that women felt in terms of it falling disproportionately on them. Um, and they also felt like they had no choice. They could either experience the shame of using home toilets or the shame of going out into the world um, and the danger thereof. So here uh, is a, a quote from there where they were talking about, in both slums, boys were said to loiter around the toilets at night. In Sundarnagri, there were cases of boys hiding in the cubicles at night, waiting to rape those who entered. They were also scared of drug addicts who were said to hide in the toilets at night. So this is just the very, very beginning of starting to look at this issue. I mean, actually, when we went into the literature, there's almost nothing on this issue. Um, and I think that there's a potential role for research, both in terms of documenting you know, investigating exposure. Right now we've only, we don't really have a sense of incidence. We don't really have a sense of prevalence of these, of, of, of this risk in comparison to other risks. Um, we also really have not attempted to measure the effects on women's health or well-being. I think even most, more importantly though, was the potential of action research and some of the types of things that you can do to try to identify solutions. And in all of the cases, um, they did talk to the women and also talk to local NGOs and Water Aid and other affiliates about what the women felt um, would help. And, and a lot of the times that <coughs> involved getting themselves involved in the sanitation issue. Um, so uh, I think we have a huge task ahead of us, and I'll leave you with that. I do just want to, oops. I just want to acknowledge um, that I'm presenting actually someone else's research and a special thanks to Oliver Cummings um, from SHARE who shared some of his slides with me. Thank you.